Now what preparations do we need to make so that the work that is committed into our hands now will meet the well done of the Lord? Each one of us will need to examine our lives in the area of our Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. I don't know about you, but what I discovered in my own personal life is that when I didn't have a lot to do, a lot to preach, a lot of places to go, I was much more like Christ. Because I had all the time to read the Bible, all the time to pray, all the time. When I read the Bible, I wasn't looking for messages for other people. I was looking for messages just for myself. When I went to church and I listened to other people preaching, I didn't write notes to say that that's a good material to teach other people. I said, that's something good for me. And every time that the preacher finished preaching, I saw the areas that I wasn't as Christ in all, like Christ in all, that made me pray. And I saw that at that time much of the prayers I prayed would be, Lord, I want to fit into your will. I want to fit into your plan. I want to be like Christ. I want to be who you want me to be. I don't know about you, but as I look at my past life, I saw that those years when there was no preaching, many, many years ago, my heart was very tender. My heart was very sensitive. And if I listened to a message of the Word of God and I found that somebody had offended me, I would immediately go to that individual and say, Jesus said, when you are offended, this is what we should do. And if I've offended somebody, because I wasn't preaching and I wasn't looking for uh, something I would preach at other people, counsel other people with, talk to other people about, I discovered that every time I listened, if I'd offended somebody, first of all, I'd go before the Lord. And as I go before the Lord, I'll say, Lord, you know this, what I've done. And then immediately I rise up. I go to the person that I offended. I had nothing to lose. I wasn't a preacher. I wasn't a leader. And the person wasn't going to say, I look at a leader confessing all this. I confessed everything I needed to confess because there was nothing to lose. I was just a member of the body of Christ. And the word of God came to me. Every time I heard about the second coming of the Lord, I said, Lord, you may come today. I wasn't setting goals and making plans and saying the church should be up to 2,000, the church should be up to 3,000. All that I wanted, all that I knew about the church was my heart. The planning was done by other people. All I was planning about is, Lord, I want to make rapture. All I was planning about is, Lord, I want to see your face on the last day. But you know that as I, you know, I've become involved in the work of the Lord, part of that time I used to think about, Lord, I want to make the rapture. Lord, I want my heart to be like your heart. Lord, I want my life to be like your life. Part of that time now, I divert into, Lord, the church should grow. And sometimes, unfortunately, I forget myself that in looking for growth, I become a little bit hard as I will not be hard before. Because in the past, I will think about the rapture, I will not be hard. Because I will think about the rapture in the past, and because I will think about what will Jesus say, what will Jesus do, I will be very, very tender like a little child. But I don't know about you, that's my experience. That the more you get involved in the work of the Lord, if you are not very careful, the less Christ-like you become. That before you start working, now you area leaders, this is a warning to you. We who have been running the race before you as pastor, as coordinator, as zonal leader, as old area leaders, we are warning you. We are telling you that before we started the work, before we became very much involved, before we became, uh, you know, very enthusiastic about church growth and about success and about this and that, we are very, very Christ-like, very, very prayerful, very, very humble, very, very devoted and very, very loving. Very, very loving. You know, before I became a, a worker, a preacher, I'd be afraid to talk to anybody with a harsh tone. Very, very afraid. Because I remember the scripture every time that if you get angry with your brother, 
and you say, Thou fool, you are in danger of hell fire. I remember that every week. And any time anybody is talking to me, I'll be saying, Lord, help me not to be angry. Help me not to lose my sanctification. But you know, it's unfortunate as I started working for God and I wanted the people to be effective. I wanted them to do the work. And if I was, you know, very soft and it was uh, going on, you know, gently and all that, they will not do the work. You know, I just forgot myself. And I'll just say, you don't do that, you're in trouble. And I'll be hard. And before I realized that I was losing the nature of Christ, I'd gone very far. Very, very far. That, and you'll say, see, you'll see, but were you not reading the Bible? Oh, yes, I was reading the Bible. But you know, I wasn't reading the Bible for myself alone anymore. I was reading the Bible for the people. Just to preach to them. Just to talk to them. And to talk to them that this is what we should do. This is what we should do. But eventually, I said, Lord, look at what's happening. I was better than this when I wasn't preaching. I think a preacher should be better than the people. But this is the reverse now. And if you look at your life, my brother, my sister, you may have discovered that as you became leaders and workers, coordinators, that now you feel, you know, if I don't do this and lose my soul and get angry and get hard and get boisterous and hammer the people on the head, hammer them on the chest, break their bones, they will not do the work. If I'm not hard on them, if I don't get angry, if I don't behave like Moses and tell them right to their face, you stiff-necked people, will I bring water out of the rock for you? If I don't tell them that they will not know their carnality, and because of that now we are less Christ-like. And you know why we are choosing to become coordinators? The people saw that we are Christ-like, so gentle and so loving and caring for the people, and they will say, that man, he behaves like a woman will encourage you like a woman if you had any problem will weep like a baby that man is so soft if we need a coordinator we need that man that's why they chose us as coordinators but now we want the work to be successful we want the zones to grow we want all the districts to grow and because of running after growth we run away from Christ we're hard on the people and the people right now they are saying, Lord, when will you come? They are fed up. And they are saying, which church shall we go again? They say, when we came to this church, it was different. They cared for us. They helped us. They prayed for us. That even this coordinator at that time was just ordinary area leader. At that time, oh, I remember that brother, he was totally different. Maybe we should fast for him, that God will help him to go back to what he was. Now his coordinator is not like he was before. Maybe the church has seen God this man in making him a coordinator. Because when he was just ordinary member of the church, I know this man, I know this man. He'll, he'll give anything, he'll do anything, he'll go any length. And I never saw him get angry before, but now his coordinator... Every time I see him, it appears that he is carrying the whole district on his head. And because of the weight and the load on the district, he gets angry every time. And we see it. And we know it. That the more the work, the less Christ-like we have become. Now we are kings, we oppress the people. The same thing with Zona leaders. When the zone was just about 300, we loved the people. When you just became a zonal leader, you know, like Saul, you said, Do, the people said, those people that said Saul will not be king, bring them here. Let us kill them. And Saul said, no, you will not kill anybody, not for me. We must be gentle towards everybody. Even those people that said I will not be king, leave them all alone. But now eventually, after you become zona leader for a time, even though you were gentle before, and anybody that said, no, we don't accept him as zona leader, we don't accept him as zona leader, well, you just said, uh, maybe because of my foolishness some years ago, maybe they are right. And I'm not even qualified to be a zona leader. I think they are right. 
And then you went to them, you said, my brother, my sister, I understand you. That you are saying, you don't accept me as zona leader. Can I tell you the truth? I don't even accept myself as zona leader. I think you are right. But you see, the church put me there. And what will I do now? If I say I will not do it, I fear that will be disobedience. Why not pray for me? And those people that said they don't accept you as zona leader, they said, ah, look at this man. He said that he's not even qualified. We thought he would hate us. We thought that he would talk against us and do this and that. They started praying for you. It is their prayer that made your zone to grow to 1,000. Not your ability. What do you know? What do you have? What can you do? Don't we know you? Are we not together? Don't we know ourselves? What ability do you have to make a zone go from 300 to 1,000? Is the prayers of the people. Is their support. But now they are 1,000. And you feel like a king. And now you are chasing after David. And David is not your problem. David is just a house fellowship leader. And any time he has opportunity, he can help you kill Goliath and put his life in danger. Why are you chasing after David? And you are telling Jonathan, Jonathan, you are the son of a foolish woman. Don't you know? As long as that David is there, you will not reign. Let's leave that in the hands of God. Why are we persecuting our fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ? Where do we want to drive them to? David said, So, what have I done? You have driven me away this day from the house of God. What have I done? Allow me to be in Israel and worship God. Now I live in caves. Now I live in dens. What have I done? And Saul said, Is that your voice, my son? Oh yes, it's my voice. If I've done anything wrong, tell me. Let me make restitution. King, you left your throne. And here you are in the wilderness chasing after me. What have I done? And I'm the one that played the instrument for the evil spirit to leave you. I'm the one that killed Goliath. When everybody was shaking, Zona leaders, what have these people done? You see, because of activity, because we've been too busy doing this and doing that, those activities have blinded us. And I will tell the people in those zones, now the church is large, anything I do, I do it. You want to see pastor? How will you see pastor? Is pastor going to wait for you like they used to do at uh, Flat 2 or they used to do at IBTC and sit down there and say, anybody that wants to see me, if you are not careful, I will send you out of the church. Because to see pastor, you cannot see pastor. You want to see him, go ahead and see him. And we know that he cannot see pastor. He's a slave. And if he doesn't accept his slavery, wholeheartedly and gently, he will die in slavery. If he's sick, nobody will look at him. Once uh, zona leader, you tell all those area leaders and ask for children, so and so is a criminal. Don't go there. They will not go there. If they go there, you stop them. You discipline them. Now, a lot of people are in exile. They are under discipline. I don't even know how many are under discipline now. We have oppressed the people. Some people just, they just pack quietly out. Leave the church. And they say, God, that's my church, but they are dreaming me out. And they say this house fellowship system is a curse on the church. It has helped some people, but it is ruining many people. And it is because zonal leaders were no more like Christ. We are no more as gentle. Now we get angry. Now we are oppressive on the people. And we tell them there's nothing they can do. And then, on Sunday, we are the people that will teach them throughout the scripture. The people are unfortunate. When will Christ come to deliver them? From the oppression and from the bondage. You new area leaders, the watchful. All of us who have been old in the work before you came. This is a trap we are falling into. That the more active we have become, the more heartless we have become. Christ, we do not have Christ now in our leadership style. From coordinator all through, even to area leader, even to usher. I was talking to Jonathan yesterday. 
I looked for him before this meeting so I could talk to him more, but he wasn't around. I think because he's not an area leader. He stopped a wife of an usher from coming to church. I didn't even know about it. Just called that wife and said, that trouble is enough. Don't come to deeper life anymore. And this is Lagos Church. And I'm still here. And the children, you cannot come to church. The husband is an usher. And the husband went to, the, to him and said, uh, my brother, now I know my wife has a problem. I will not defend my wife. I know she is not born again. And you know, brethren, I've been praying with me that this woman will be born again. Now you say she should not come to church anymore. Okay, let me see pastor. And Jonathan said, I'm sorry for you. You cannot see pastor. What does the man do now? The wife is sent out of the church. Not even by a coordinator. By usher. They cannot come to church. And I didn't know about it. When we send sinners away from church, how are we evangelizing? What are we doing again? So, our activities have been making us to forget Christ. And I had to, when I heard about it, I called that usher. Since they won't allow him to see me ordinarily, I had to send for him. And I saw him, I said, I heard about your trouble. Then I called the usher himself, Jonathan. I said, tell me about this. So he said, yes, the wife did this and the children did that. We interviewed them and we saw that uh, they were, uh, things were bad. So I told her not to come to church again. I said, Jonathan, I'm still alive as a pastor. How can you send somebody away from the church when I'm still here? Now that's not right. And I apologize to the brother. This brother is having, living with an unbelieving wife having trouble at home. He comes to church, he has trouble. They want us to kill him. The man will die like that. He's in the house, the wife is not uh, cooperating. And then, in the church too, and he was taught to, the work he was doing, he couldn't do. Because his wife is, you know, the wife is not behaving well, the children are wrong, so he has been stopped his work, and he is just allowed to be coming to church. But he's coming to church, he cannot see pastor, a fatherless child. Where are we leading the church to? And it's not only Jonathan that is guilty. I don't know how many people coordinators have sent away from church. How can I know when they will not even allow them to come and see me? I don't know how many people, zona leaders, have sent away from church. They are bad. I think Judas Iscariot was bad. But Jesus didn't send him away. Let's be very, very careful that we do not just take laws into our hands and oppress the people until the people feel that this is no more a church. The doctrines are there. And I think we have the understanding of the doctrine. But we don't have the heart to believe and to act on the doctrine. Let me ask you, which of the zonal leaders, let me start with the coordinators, which of the coordinators now can somebody slap on the right cheek and that coordinator will turn the other cheek? I don't know if you know any of them. I know I've not found one. Which of the zonal leaders now can somebody slap on the one cheek and it will turn the other cheek? Maybe you know them more than I do. I've not found any of them. And if the church is like this, I think we should be praying that Jesus shall come. Before we contaminate these new area leaders, I think they should be taken away to heaven and let the old heads, the people that are old and incorrigible, before they contaminate the new people, let Christ do something for the new generation. We need to change. We need to call upon the Lord. You see, Solomon was very wise. When we talk about wisdom, Solomon was very, very wise. But after he died, the people came. They said, Rehoboam, you know your father. Very, very wise. But he oppressed us. Now, will you help us and lift up the body? Now you are the son. We will serve you, but lift up the body. 
like father, like son, like coordinator, like zonal leaders, like zonal leaders, like area leaders. And Rehoboam said, you didn't see anything. My thumb will be thicker than the waist of my father. He whipped you with ordinary waves. I will tie scorpions at the tail end of the waves and beat you with scorpions. That's how they scattered Israel. And right now, that's what is taking place. That the coordinators, my, with all the Bible I know, with all the prayer I prayed, when I saw that I was getting away far, farther and farther from Christ's likeness, and I prayed that, Lord, help me, even with all that prayer, if I stayed under the leadership of some coordinators, I think I'll need to pray more. That God will help me to be able to keep on through to the end. It's hard. Very hard. I see it. I know it. And sometimes when people are going, they're leaving the church, they write to me. Last week, I've not seen the person now. The person wrote to me and said, I've tried to see you. I've not been able to see you. The oppression is too much for me. I think I'm leaving. So the person that the fellow told said, the pastor is your father and the Lord. You are his convert. Whatever is happening, wait for him. Don't live like that. So I sent a message back to the fellow and said, if you want to uh, see me, don't talk about leaving. If you accept me as pastor and father in the Lord, don't talk about leaving. If you don't talk about leaving, I'll look into the matter. But if you talk about leaving, since you've made up your mind, you are spoiling the case. And eventually I think the person said, okay, I'll wait for him. But how are we going to continue like this? Those are the people that can write. How about illiterates that cannot write? Like this woman that Jonathan sent away from church, the woman, you know, being an illiterate, could not write any letter, could not do anything, just stayed at home. And I wouldn't have known. But you have seen that it's not just Solomon. And when we're choosing people, how do we choose people? We choose people, we say, they have wisdom. But the more wisdom they have, the more oppression they bring. Maybe the illiterates will help us better. Those who are not very, very wise. Those who are not clever. Those who are not cunning. Those who will not be telling the pastor, everything is all right in my district. They cannot make restitution. They cannot make any confession coordinators. Even if they kill people and bury them, they'll just say, well, we're some, we're, uh, sorry, somebody died. How did he die? They won't tell us. Somebody died. Is it our neglect? Somebody died. Is it that when we told the people, don't go to them, don't pray for them, we have sent them to hell. We have sealed their doom. That's how the people died. But they won't tell us how they died. They just say somebody died. We need to talk to the Lord in prayer. That's why we're here this weekend. That we'll see what we have been doing. And if you look at, over here we've written, uh, we've written the uh, responsibilities of zonal leaders. You will not see in any of those responsibilities that zonal leaders, women representatives, area leaders, as fellowship leaders can discipline somebody without reference. Now they put coordinators here. But with all that I'm seeing now, I'm even afraid that we'll make reference only to coordinators. Because those coordinators themselves, God help them to make heaven. Discipline is not in the hand of coordinator. Discipline is not in the hand of zonal leader. The coordinator is just supposed to love, just supposed to care. Not that what you take a whip around and you are whipping them in every zone. Even Jesus Christ didn't do that to his own disciples. He did it once in the temple. Because he had made his father's house a den of thieves and robbers. But not on people that are born again. The people that want to serve the Lord. Who are beating you like that when you were born again and converted. All the time we took you from uh, Flat 2 to Oyingbo to 
to Moshi and then to Bagada. If we're dealing with you like that, many of you will not remain. Have you been perfect since you came to a deeper life? Tell me. Have you been perfect? Uh -uh. If you have not been perfect since you came, why can't we bear with the imperfections of the people? I believe that Christ's heart is bleeding. I'm not like Christ yet myself. So it's somebody must preach. Sometimes I'm hard to. Sometimes I'm inconsiderate to. But at least I can confess my own. The problem is with people that do it and they can never confess it. And you know, if I can confess it to you, I'll confess it to God. And somebody who makes confessions like I do will not remain the same. The people that remain the same are the people that never make any confession. They say they are okay, but they are not okay. When I'm not okay, I know I'm not okay. And I tell God, and I will tell you when I'm not okay, I'll say, Church, I'm not okay. Pray for me. But when you say you are okay, how do we pray for you? When you don't, we are not like Christ, and you say you are like Christ, how do we pray for you? And Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Let's rise up and pray.